It's round five of the 2024 ABB FIA Formula E World Championship, and we are in Japan for the first time ever. It is time to go racing in Tokyo. Free practice two coming up here this morning. Then we've got qualifying a little bit later on, and we're heading into the race this afternoon for the first ever Tokyo E3. There has been such a buzz, such a great atmosphere here this weekend, not only here at the circuit, but also just in Tokyo as well. Formula E is on the lips of seemingly pretty much every person in the land, and there's a lot of people here. 14.8 million is the population in Tokyo. Now, as you can see, we have had a very exciting season so far in 2024. Four different winners in four races this year. Are we going to make it a fifth here this afternoon? about to find out what the pecking order will look like in free practice two here this morning. Thankfully, the sunshine is out following a uh, wet start to the day here yesterday, which did clear, but left the track quite wet for free practice one. Here is the calendar for 2024. As you can see, Tokyo in Japan is our stop for round five on the championship. We were in Brazil a couple of weeks ago. Before that, Saudi Arabia and Mexico kicked off the start of the season. Anyway, in a couple of weeks' time, we head over to Misano in Italy. Then we're in Monaco, Berlin, Shanghai, Portland, and then London to complete our 16-round season. A lot of double headers there to uh, end off the year and a lot of opportunity for things to change in the championship battle. And as you can see, of course, with four different winners in four races. It has been a hugely exciting season. So I'd like to say that joining me in commentary here for free practice two, reserve driver for Porsche, Andre Lotterer, and also reserve development driver for Andretti, Zane Maloney as well. Andre, first of all, come to yourself. Great to have you back in comps. How you been? Ohio, Ohio gozaimashita. That's how they, they say it here. Good morning, <laughs> Japan. Been good. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's great to be uh, to be back uh, with you. And but it's great to have Tokyo as well on the calendar. I've, uh, it's like my second home here. So seeing all these images, it's uh, it's super cool uh, to see Formula E racing here. Well, this is the circuit then, two and a half kilometers long. There's the Tokyo Tower. We're over by the Tokyo Bay. Uh, Zane, this Tokyo circuit is really tight and twisty in some sections, but then as you come into the second sector, it sort of really opens up a bit. Yeah, for sure. I mean, firstly, it's great to be on here. First commentary event. Um, Tokyo is a very bumpy track, a street circuit, of course, so very difficult for the drivers. Um, I mean, I'm sure everyone's backs will be feeling it at the end of the weekend, um, but yeah, looking forward to, to great racing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this is out of turn 15, one of the fastest sections of the circuit, into the chicane of 17 and 18, turns 19 and 20, completing the lap, and that's when the drivers will come across the timing line. You can see attack mode there uh, will be activated on turn four in the race as well, which will give the drivers 350 kilowatts of power, some 50 kilowatts more uh, than they would have uh, normally. As you can see here, nice and sunny, dry conditions in Tokyo, 24 degrees track temperature, air temperature of 17 degrees. I mean, compared to 24 hours ago, Andre, it's a complete night and day difference. Yeah, luckily I wasn't here uh, in the morning when there was so much rain, I arrived just after that. But as you can see in turn one, it's still wet, so that's gonna be a big challenge for the drivers because, uh, okay, yesterday they learned the track, but uh, today they really wanna get up to speed for, for qualifying. And without a, a proper dry turn one, that's going to be difficult. Absolutely, well, here is Nick Cassidy, the man who leads the drivers championship only by five points though so i wonder whether the tables are going to turn here this weekend it's jaguar's 100th race in formula e they had a celebration uh, in tokyo last night to commemorate that also mitch edlund's 100th race in the championship as well because he's been with jaguar for the entirety of his career just looking inside the andretti garage there at jake dennis now zane it was a really interesting first session that we had here yesterday that wet circuit and the disruptive running in particular made things very unpredictable. What do you think the drivers would have learned from that session? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's not so much to learn when the track's uh, quite far off and, uh, of course, quite wet in turn one. But we see we woke up this morning expecting dry and it's still wet in turn one. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's going to be very difficult for the drivers uh, straight away into FP2 and then qualifying. Um, you need to be on it straight away as a driver. So I'm sure that's, that's what everyone's trying to do and think about and, and then it's the team's job to, to try to give them the best car. Well, the green light is on. Free practice two gets underway then here on the streets of Tokyo as the drivers head out onto the circuit for the first time here this morning. You can still see a little bit of standing water there on the exit of the pit lane and also a little bit on the start-finish straight as well. Of course, the sun is going to come over the circuit. We'll dry it out a little bit later on here. 
Yeah, the big question is now for the teams and the drivers is uh, what will be the, the better lap for the tires? Is it out prep push or two preps? But there are two uh, aspects here now because the track temperature will um, will rise naturally. And then also the, the fact that turn one is still wet. So um, they will not really have the proper answer until qualifying and maybe find out in, in, in qualifying. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how it all works out as the drivers sort of filter their way onto the circuit. It's good to see the grandstands actually pretty full. It's very early in the morning here, just 8 o'clock local time in Tokyo. And we thank you for wherever you're joining us in the world, in particular if you're in the UK at the moment. I know that it's uh, sort of the middle of the night over there. So uh, we thank you for sticking with us, whether you've gone to bed and gotten up or whether you're just powering on through here for the Tokyo E3. It is great to have your company, and we're very much looking forward to seeing what is going to happen on the streets here. Now, Nissan as we look at Tommaso Volpe in the Nissan garage. Uh, fresh off the back of two back-to-back -back podiums for, uh, for Oliver Rowland, Zane, they've looked pretty strong here uh, so far this weekend. Oli was uh, looking pretty handy yesterday, but Sasha Fenestras on the other side of the garage, we saw him having a bit of a coming together with Sam Bird at T-Run. Yeah, they have looked very strong. I mean, different powertrains go diff good at different tracks. Uh, and of course, for Sasha yesterday, he was coming out the pit lane, minding his own business. Um, I saw him in the hotel this morning. He's ready to go. Wrist is fine, and yeah, I'm sure he'll be going for it today. Yeah, just looking on board here with Sasha Fenestras. Special livery on that Nissan here this weekend. It is cherry blossom season, and uh, of course, it is a home race for Nissan as well. So commemorating that, and also special helmet designs for both Fenestras and Oliver Rowan. You can see as we head down in towards the first corner, that's standing water as drivers go onto the brakes. I mean, compared to what we had in FP1 yesterday, it's actually a lot drier and a lot easier. We saw them Tokyo drifting their way into that first turn. Yeah, yeah, that was really tricky, but I think it's still tricky now because um, this tyre compound is a bit on the hard side, so as soon as uh, you hit a bit of a wet patch, it's um, the, the grip drops dramatically. So um, it's, again, a bit of uh, risk management uh, to see how, how deep you go into turn one and uh, get your rhythm there, but also focusing on sector two and three. Just running on board here with Sasha Penetras, just talk us through the, this uh, this lap as we look at it with uh, with the French Argent tyres. Yeah, I think they're still warming up tyres, uh, trying to find the limits. Do you think and, if we do a scenario um, one, waving on straight. just to put some heat on both brakes, I will have less discrepancy? So I think they're saying that he needs to box there. I saw it, we, It's a little bit low uh, in my earphones, unfortunately. There, <laughs> so I, I didn't, didn't quite hear. didn't quite catch what he was saying uh, on the team radio. But uh, yeah, a bit of bit of communication coming through there for Sasha Fenestras. Two envisions go top early door. Sebastian Buemi currently leading the way from teammate Robin Freins. Freins actually quickest here yesterday morning. Uh, yesterday afternoon, I should say rather, and uh, looking pretty good, especially considering they had a tough time at Sao Paulo a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, but here's a completely different uh, story. New track for everyone, and uh, yeah, Robin is uh, it's quite a natural. You we saw him already dancing with the car around this track, and uh, I think that pays off. You know, it's uh, it's an opportunity to do to do well when there's a new track. Uh, sometimes, you know, some drivers uh, manage to extract more um, and, and make a difference. But uh, yeah, it's, it's it's super exciting here. You see this chicane; like they're going to have to take a lot of risk, and I think yeah, flirting with the walls and. Uh, and Pushing the limits, um, it will separate uh, a bit uh, the lap times, uh, I guess. Yeah, running aboard here with Sebastian Bobby, see a driver's eye view. I mean, it's incredibly interesting how busy this circuit is, saying. There's, uh, the corners seem to come at you just left, right, and centre. I mean, there's 20 of them over this two and a half kilometres of lap. Yeah, definitely. I mean, any street circuit is difficult, and then when you get a street circuit that is so bumpy, uh, I mean, for the drivers to, to be very precise is, is important. Um, we can see, it, especially in the Formula E car, there's a lot of movement with the car and the steering wheel throughout the lap. Uh, so it's just really important for, for them to be very precise and especially with turn one being wet, it's, uh, it's very difficult at the moment. Just looking here at Robin Price, this is coming through in the first sector, through turn, uh, sorry, Sasha Bromi, I should say, just coming through the first sector. So that's through turn two, then into the right. And you can just see that compression going on the yeah, run down here. The, the back wheels are actually getting off the ground. Yeah, the whole car apparently uh, takes off and then the landing is quite hard. These cars are not made to, to jump like that. And I think a lot of teams probably had to, to raise their cars and to make it a bit more compliant because you don't want to have uh, technical problems either when the car is bottoming so hard and uh, being, being so harsh. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, Tommaso Volpe is a man who is, uh, I'm sure, grinning from ear to ear given Nissan's results over the last couple of rounds. Back to back podiums. And as Oliver Rowland just goes fastest, let's head down to the pit lane for the first time with Alexa. Uh, she's catching up with the Nissan team principal. Yeah, I'm joined now by Tommaso Volpe. And Tommaso, talk to us. We saw Sasha Fenestra was having an incident at the end of FP1 yesterday. We saw him icing his hand, heard on the team radio that he was feeling a bit sore. How's he doing today? No, he's doing well. He's doing well. Uh, thanks God. <laughs> thanks God we checked everything uh, last night and uh, it was just a minor, a minor pain. And is the car doing okay? Was there repairs required on the car overnight? Sorry, sorry. Sorry, were there repairs required on the car overnight? No, 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 no. just the wing, but nothing, nothing mechanical, just the wing, so it was very easy. Yeah. And let's talk about the track conditions today. Obviously, it's basically still half wet, half dry out there. That's going to be pretty challenging looking ahead to quality. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, they are doing their best to, to dry everything, so I think that we hope that the, the, the challenge will stay only for free practice, but in quality everything will be okay. Having said that, as usual, it's uh, challenging for, for everyone, so it's, uh, it's even. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tommaso. Yeah, thanks, Alex. There, thanks to Tommaso Volpe, Nissan team principal as well. Great to catch up with him. Yeah, Sasha Fenestra is getting involved in a bit of an incident with Sam Bird in free practice one yesterday. Not his fault at all. Uh, basically, was coming out of the pit lane. Bird locked up, as a lot of other drivers did. Went down to the first corner, wrong place, wrong time. Both of them coming together, and Fenestra is having a bit of a cold compress on his hand afterwards. But thankfully, all okay following that. Anyway. 22 minutes left of free practice too. Jake Dennis currently the man who is quickest overall. Zane, he was a little bit further down the order than I was expecting yesterday. Everything okay with, with Jake in the car and so on? Yeah, all good. Um, I mean, each session you try to optimise uh, the run plan and, and what you want to learn as well. Um, I'm sure that his plan is more to be there when qualifying comes and free practice one and free practice two for the team is, is to more optimise everything for qualifying. So. That's the plan, and I mean, hopefully uh, in qualifying we'll see. It's got a red flag that's just come out here as well. Not quite sure what this is all about. I haven't seen a yellow. Oh. oh, there we are. That'll be why. There's some debris on the circuit. Looks like it might be from an ERT. Uh, okay, everyone, for brace control, uh, this red flag is for some debris at turn 8. Um, sorry, turn 12. Um, it's going to be a quick turnaround. Be a quick turnaround. We'll just pick the debris up and then get going again. So that's the voice of race director Scott Elkins. You can just see inside race control. He's back after a uh, one race absence where he was uh, actually dialed in for Sao Paulo from home. But uh, he's back here in Tokyo this weekend. But the red flag is out. The timer does continue to count down. So what happens now from a team perspective? Because does that we had red flags yesterday. It disrupted everybody's running. Is that kind of the same thing? Are they resetting? Are they going to have to reevaluate what they do? Yeah, the, the engineers work on the run plan uh, with a precise timing, and then uh, this uh, obviously gets updated. Uh, for the drivers, quite annoying because you know track time is very limited anyhow. So especially on a new track, then uh, you're thinking, ah, oh, uh, that's uh, that's annoying. But uh, it's the same for everyone, and um, I don't know. I don't see any car on track or anything. So maybe it's just to clean debris, and uh, maybe it'll be a, a, a short interruption. But um, yeah, it's always a bit. Uh, uh, a deal breaker, but yeah, same for everyone. Just got Jay Penske there inside the DS Penske garage. First time I've seen him without his shades on so far this year. I mean, it is quite early in the morning, to be fair. You can see the Japanese fans all in here as well. Yeah, the Japanese fans, they are so committed. So, as the drivers come back into the pit lane, and get themselves ready to go. Let's have a look. Oh, it was Lucas de Grassi actually in the Apt Cupra that went off. It was a. Oh, so he's clipped the front there going through the chicane. Uh, we thought a few drivers would come a cropper with this one. Yeah, there you really have to push the limits. And uh, depending on how well you, you hit the first curb, uh, that's uh, that's what happened to Lucas there. He uh, he got pushed off a little bit into uh, into the second wall. And, uh, you know, it's sometimes you really close your eyes because you think you're, you're going to just touch it and then it's just fine. But uh, that's playing with the limit. Uh, luckily, uh, no bigger consequences. A, a tiny bit more, I think his front wheel would have been uh, stuck in and that would have been a big shunt but um, yeah we, we, we start to see drivers pushing now so it's, it's good yeah just looking inside the uh, garages now as all the teams and drivers get themselves ready from a driver's perspective Zane is it quite frustrating when you get a, a red flag like this in the middle of free practice especially given we didn't have a clean session yesterday 
Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, like Andre said, uh, it's the same for everyone, but you have a run plan going into the session, and when that gets interrupted, it's it's never great. Um, for sure, I think that the plan for the teams now would to just be go through settings, uh, see what they can improve with the car from the initial thoughts. Um, so sometimes it could be a good thing and improve the car, and I'm sure that's what everyone will be trying to do right now. So just looking inside the uh, Andretti garage then here at the moment, this is the reigning world champion, Jake Dennis. One race victory so far this year with one win in uh, Diria a couple of months ago for the second round of the season. Nick Cassidy as well, three podiums he had at the start of the year. That came to a very unfortunate end in Sao Paulo a couple of weeks ago. Ended up clipping the back of one of the drivers. Front wing went under the car a little bit later on in the lap. And uh, unfortunately, ended up crashing out of the race. His first DNF of the season as the green flag flies. And we do get FP2 now back underway following that short interruption. As Ian James McLaren, team principal. Sam Bird, of course, taking the win last time out. Let's have a look at Jake Hughes here. It's going down into the chicane. This is where Lucas Degrassi went off, and Jake Hughes there just exploring the braking distance a little bit further. Yeah, it's interesting to see now the evolution from uh, last year to this year. You don't see cars lock up much because their anti locking systems became much better. So, um, Last year, you'd see like, the inside wheel lock a bit more, and uh, the teams are finding the limits a bit more. And uh, Because normally, uh, a situation like that, you, you would have seen smoke and, and drive a track to stop the car. <laughs> well, one of the frustrations for a lot of the drivers yesterday was the fact they weren't able to get a quali sim in at the end of the session. Dan Tictum, in particular, was really frustrated on the team radio uh, with the fact that he'd gone for an attack lap and then found out that the session had been extended by a couple more minutes, and it just disrupted his is running. So do you think they're going to use this FP2 session as a bit of a sim for quality later on? Yeah, definitely. That's always the aim. You know, you first, I think for all the drivers on a new track like this, you, you try to find a rhythm, trying to find your limits and uh, and then Just naturally the get into the Excessive sim trap. Peak, brake pressure T19. Okay. Excessive peak, brake pressure T19. Talk us through that. Yes. Yeah, so, um, during the red flag, the car came in, and then they were able to download the data, and the perfect engineer goes through everything, and uh, we know where the car operates the best, and um, because, you know, it's not like just brake discs, you have a lot of systems, you, you're braking on the front motor, you're trying to be uh, on, uh, on the best uh, um, efficiency there, and uh, sometimes when you just brake too hard, the systems don't like it, so um, the perfect engineer helps you on, on, on your best ways. So just over 16 and a half minutes to go of this session. Just looking here at Norman Nato in the Andretti. Zaney had a tough weekend at uh, Sao Paulo a couple of weeks ago. I'm assuming he's sort of wanting to reset coming to this one and, and just move forward, really. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Norman is in a great place. He's, he's a great driver and uh, he has so much experience. So I think that he's now learned how to put a bad weekend behind him and push on for the next weekend. Uh, and, and yesterday, I mean, he had a good FP1. Um, and I think that on performance runs, he's he's right there with Jake. So it's just uh, it's going to be interesting to see what he can do this weekend. Hopefully, a good job. Yeah, just running aboard here with uh, Norman as he makes his way through. You can just see how fast all these corners are coming up. This is into the chicane of 17 and 18. The compression down the hill. He's just fighting the steering wheel the entire way through this through this lap. Lots of bites at the corners and that sort of thing. And he, again, not a lot of grip because of course these uh, these tyres don't necessarily offer. He's on a good lap there. He went P1. He so did. yeah, that's that's Formula E driving. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's uh, it's really cool. Uh, it's always I've always said it's a mixture, a bit of not let's say rally driving, but it's a completely different game than racing on a on a on a permanent circuit where you have very minimal and very clean steering input. Formula E, it's really like hands-on and the, it's actually fun because the driver can do a lot. You know, you're correcting all the time. You 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 you're balancing the car with throttle brakes, steering and uh, a lot of small direction changes and uh, yeah it's like like talk to drift a little bit here. <laughs> well Zane when you compare it to your you know your f2 car for example i mean i imagine a completely different style of driving but how do you adapt as a, as a driver when you're you know chopping and changing between the two it's very difficult like andre said you're always going at the wheel informally there's not much downforce so it's uh, it's fun i mean it's it's like going back almost to your karting days where you're you're just on the edge trying to push as hard as you can of course, in a Formula 2 car, when you when you have a, a bit of oversteer, you lose downforce, and then it becomes bigger. 
uh, loss. Whereas in Formula E, you're sliding, you're you're really pushing the limit. So I mean, for a driver, it's it's the best thing you can get. So 100 races for Jaguar here uh, this weekend, and as I said, they had a bit of a celebration in Tokyo yesterday. Uh, let's head down to the Jaguar pit box with Alexa. She's catching up with James Barkley, and I wonder if he's got a bit of a sore head this morning. We'll have to ask him, Tom, but thank you so much, James, for joining us. So before we talk about your 100 races, let's chat about today's session, because this is a really tricky track out there, especially looking ahead to Quali, where it should have dried up by then. Yeah. A new track is basically always a bit of a, a challenge to start with. You're just trying to get the car in the right window. But it's a, yeah, it seems to be a really uh, an enjoyable challenge so far. You know, a lot of undulation, it's pretty bumpy. So just trying to get the car underneath the drivers is the important thing right now. Um, yeah, it comes on a great day as well, uh, celebrating our 100th race. Yeah, talk to me about that. How was the event last night? I presume you were surrounded by partners, the drivers, the team. Yeah, actually, as you can imagine, although um, it's nice to celebrate that, uh, my eyes firmly on this weekend. So it was a pretty early night, but no, great to, to get together with, as you say, uh, partners, employees, and members of the media as well, just to, to mark that moment, right? It's been an incredible 100 races with some amazing memories along the way. Um, and something I'm really proud of, and the whole team here is really proud of as well. But they're just that, their memories, and uh, we're here to make new ones. And what can we expect from your 100th race today? Are you feeling strong? Uh, you know, we always give it our best, right? And we are absolutely hungry to, to keep delivering on the podiums that we've started this season out with. So, yes, that's the, that's the goal. And um, just, it's great to be here in Tokyo. What an amazing place to have a race, right? And uh, it's nice to be, to be doing that for the first time here in Formula E. Thank you so much, James. Back to you, Tom. No mention of any uh, karaoke at that Jaguar event last night, which is a bit of a shame. I wondered if we, well, I was thinking what song would we get James Barkley to belt out? Probably She's Electric by Oasis would be, <laughs> would be appropriate, right? But Jaguar, uh, third and fourth fastest with just over 12 minutes of this session. On board we ride here with Antonio Felix da Costa in the Tagoy Porsche. A special livery for them here this weekend. They've gone pink in Japan. Yeah, super cool livery. Uh, I really love it. And uh, yeah, it's always uh, nice to, to see teams uh, doing special liveries for special places. I think it's very unique that we, we can come and race here and uh, yeah, you can recognize the car so, so well and uh, it's, uh, I think everyone is so enthusiastic about coming and racing here and uh, yeah. Absolutely, yeah, just looking here at Oliver Roller making his way through, oh, that compression just coming out of three. I mean, I tell you what, the drivers are not going to like it so much. For us here in the commentary box, though, this is great. Yeah, I, I love watching it. Uh, for them, their back is going to be feeling it at the end of the weekend. And I know there's a couple of them throughout the track. Um, it's also difficult for the engineers to set a car up when you have such big jumps like that. Because uh, for some of the track, you want something. And then for the rest, where the bumps are, you want something different. So, I mean, this is a difficult track for everyone. Roland on a particularly good first section at the moment as he comes down into the chicane. Oh, threading the eye of a needle through there. So you what, you're, you're going to see some some drivers on the edge there. Uh, in quality. I'm not surprised if someone's going to miss that, that chicane and have a big one. Yeah, absolutely. Just looking at Roland making his way through. This is into the uh, second and third sectors of the lap. This is where it sort of begins to open up and gets mightily fast. And I dare say, as we come through this uh, quick left hand into the chicane, we obviously see a few shenanigans come qualifying here later on this morning. You can see Roland soaring away at the wheel. Just a little bit of traffic as he makes his way through that final sector in the form of Max Gunter. And he's a bit frustrated, actually, at the Maserati driver. He's making his feelings abundantly clear. Yeah, it's always difficult in pre-practice to uh, manage this, you know. It's not always on purpose, uh, but you're the driver in front, like, he looks for, for a gap to, to go for a lap, you know, he relies on his engineer to, to give you... Whoa, the car really jumps. Huh? That's so difficult there as well, because it's not even a straight line, so you're jumping and turning, it uh, must be quite, uh, quite tough. So looking here, it's uh, Fenestras there now making his way through. He's managed to get a bit of clear air, thankfully, for uh, him out on track. And uh, likewise, his teammate Oliver Rowland as well will be hoping to uh, keep continuing to go a little bit faster. See a few drivers now in attack mode here as well. So that means they've got 350 kilowatts of power compared to the uh, regular 300. How do you implement that as a driver over the course of, of this session here, Zane? Yeah, it's very important also in practice to try the 350. Because uh, into qualifying, if you make it to the duels, that's what you'll be using. Um, and then your brake references change, everything changes about the circuit. So uh, it's really important for, for the drivers and teams to, to use both 300 and 350. 
of course, as a driver, you like as much power as you, you want uh, all the time. Um, so I think that's the time where the driver enjoys it most. Yeah, absolutely. So just looking at uh, Fenestraz making his way through now under 10 minutes left of this session. You can see underneath the uh, front wing as he makes his way out of the final corner. Good amount of support here for uh, Nissan this weekend, of course, this being their home event. They've actually committed to Gen 4, the first manufacturer and the first team to do so up until 2030. This is Mortara. Oh, he's ruined our camera there. <laughs> as he comes out of turn three. Senna and Bill. Oh, he clipped the wall, didn't oh. he? Just on the exit. Let's have another look. Now, this is uh, Fenestraz just going through. And one of the uh, Maseratis there as well. He just clipped the wall on the exit of three. And turn one really doesn't want to dry. And it's still still a bit wet, so... Yeah, it's just gone fastest, though. So oh, yeah. he's not slowed him up too much, even yeah. if he was flirting with a bit of danger. <laughs> Yeah, lap times are always uh, improving, and as you said, uh, they're they're going for 350 now. But I think this track is not as uh, power sensitive because it's so, um, let's say, low speed in terms of uh, straights and everything. So um, I think drivers will want to to optimize their 300 kilowatt laps to to make sure they get into the groove. Absolutely, and times in terms of uh, lap time, that is, 1.19.9 is the fastest set by Edda Mortara in the Mahindra. Yesterday in FP1, of course, it was a little bit wetter, was a 1.20.865, so about a second or so quicker. You'd expect that with a bit of track evolution and the fact that it's uh, uh, a little bit drier. But really interesting to see how much faster this circuit is going to get. So Zane, obviously this track is very different to the one we had in Sao Paulo a uh, fortnight ago. In terms of what race we're going to expect, we've got 32 kilowatts of energy, we've got 33 laps for the drivers. We had a bit of a peloton style in uh, in Sao Paulo, so what that meant was you know, drivers wanting to reserve energy and not wanting to, to lead because they were trying to keep as much energy as possible. Are we going to be expecting the same thing here, or is it going to be a bit of a different kettle of fish? I think it's, it's very interesting. I mean, this track in general is very difficult to overtake, uh, so let's say quite easy to defend, but I think that the race is going to be quite power sensitive, so to uh, to defend while saving energy is is a difficult thing for the drivers and I think all these Formula E drivers have kind of gotten experts at it um, but for sure we'll see some some interesting racing and uh, if turn one is still wet that's already going to be an interesting part at the start um, I think we're in for a good race yeah I think it should be pretty exciting what, what do you make of things Andre um, yeah there'll definitely be no no peloton uh, here because slipstream effect will not uh, be as powerful as uh, in Sao Paulo because there was a really long straight and uh, that that uh, is a is not the case here so uh, I think it will be um, yeah it will be quite strategic and you'll see also um, driving drivers trying to push their limits and push others to make mistakes because uh, it's very hard to overtake so I think you will see them really close together and uh, yeah and hope for, for things to happen. So just looking at uh, Nick Cassidy just on the right hand side of your picture now riding on board with his teammate Mitch Evans special helmet design with Jaguar celebrating their 100th race here this weekend, but also Mitch Evans uh, celebrating his 100th. Only three team members have been here for all 100 Macy, uh, races. That includes Mitch Evans. It includes uh, his uh, race engineer, Giuseppe, as well, and also, of course, team principal, uh, James Barkley. They've been there from the very start right up until the present day. And we heard from James Barkley a few minutes ago. They're looking to make some more new happy memories on the streets of Tokyo. Evans currently third quickest. Cassidy on an attack mode lap, though. Uh, 13th fastest for the time being as we see him negotiating his way through turns one and two over the compression of turn three it's really busy in that first sector qualifying especially the group stages in particular is it's going to be a bit frenetic i reckon yeah it will be tricky and uh, again like turn one is not dry i think it will be dry for qualifying because today it's sunny and at some point it will heat up and uh, drivers will find out in, in, in quality where to break and uh, see who who masters it the best. But I think uh, it's it's all one section. You need to, to, to hit the turn one perfect to be on the right apex for turn two, three over the bump. And uh, the whole thing is, uh, the whole section is very technical. Oh, Cassidy there sliding his way out of uh, the chicane and uh, making his way down into the next part of the lap. It's not a personal best at the moment. Still some six tenths of a second adrift as we ride on board uh, with the Kiwi through the left-hander over the rise. 
I bet it looks uh, really physical. I, I need to ask some drivers, but I think this type of track. Oh, oh yeah, you see, pushing the limits, bit of runoff area. It's always a good comfort. Uh, sometimes you don't have that, and then it's in the wall. But uh, here, bit of reverse gear check, and uh, it's actually not reverse. The motor reverses. Um, so. Um, yeah, that's just finding out about the limits and making sure you get back on track uh, in a safe manner. Yeah, all okay. Just lost the rear going into the chicane of uh, turn 16 and 17 there for Nick Cassidy, but all fine. Had to wait a little bit before he could get himself back out on track as we look at the Tagoy Porsche of Antonio Felix da Costa. Finally got some points on the board after a challenging start to his 2024. If you look back to where he was in Diria, he just looked like he had no direction, was all at sea. Hopefully now we can use that as a positive and find that momentum. Yeah, for sure. Like, of course, his first two races were not what he wanted, and he knows he can do better than that. He knows uh, he he belongs up there. And uh, but sometimes your confidence takes a little hit, and uh, you need th that one good result to uh, to feel good again. And uh, he showed uh, in Sao Paulo that he's he's back and he can lead races. And uh, now I think yeah, that step by step you build back your confidence. And here is uh, looks like he's on a on a good lap, on a good push. Got a double yellow flag down at turn five as well. Just trying to see what that is all about. Can't see any drivers that have come across. So I wonder if it maybe it's due to a little bit of debris uh, out on circuit. But everybody's seemingly okay for come to the track map that we've got up here in the commentary box. So three minutes now left of this session, and hopefully that double yellow will go away before too long because drivers will not want the end of their session disrupted like we had yesterday. Nico Muller just going seventh fastest in the Apt Cupra. Looking here at Felix da Costa, goes up into third. So he'll be pretty happy uh, with his time so far in this session. Edin Mortara is putting in a really good shift here uh, for Mahindra Zane. He's, he's gone to the duels last time out in, uh, in Sao Paulo. He seems to have adapted to that car quite well. Yeah, for sure. Again, another very experienced driver who will be leading the team uh, with Nick. And yeah, they, they seem to be making good steps forward. Um, Right now, I'd say Roland is uh, looking the strongest mm -hmm. on this track. Uh, also, yesterday, he was very strong. So uh, I think we can see a lot of different teams and drivers uh, switching around through the weekend. And that's part of a Mahindra that has come a cropper at turn five. So more debris that has come off one of the cars. Looks like the front wing assembly there. Looks like quite a clean break, actually, if nothing yeah. else. But um, trying to work out if that was Mortara or De Vries. De Vries is in the pit lane, so I wonder whether it might be him. He's crawled back round and has come back in. I think it was the freeze because uh, last images I saw from Tower they looked look good. So, um, oh, oh, that's uh, Jean that Verne just pushing the calls. limits. <laughs> yeah, inform informally it's always like you break, you break, you break, and then you're never sure you're going to make it in the corner. And then when you're sure, you commit. But there it was a bit in between, and that's always tricky because if it's in between, then you're you always have the risk to to go into the to, into the next wall. So the, luckily he saved it. Yeah, all OK there. It was indeed De Vries, the driver who lost his front wing, uh, down at turn uh, five, only a minute and a half left of the session. All drivers uh, now out on track as we look at the man who was fastest in FP1 yesterday, Robin Freitz, coming across the timing line. Eighth quickest for him. He's now on an attack mode lap, but oh, overcooks it at the first corner. Not the first time we've seen that this weekend, and I'm sure not the last either. As I said in FP1 yesterday, ABB will be grateful for the advertising representation they've got here this weekend. <laughs> Even though it's a little dirty now. Yeah, absolutely. So through into turn four. This is where attack mode is going to be activated in the race. Still the slippery surface flag out as we ride on board here with uh, Felix da Costa. Currently third fastest. Porsche powertrain not looking too bad in second and third there, Zane. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that this is a good track for the Porsche powertrain as well. Andre, what do you think? Um, yeah, good powertrain should be working everywhere. So it's not only about uh, the powertrain. I think on this track, it's about uh, putting it all together and, and finding the right um, settings. With uh, you see the dampers, the, you need to, to be on top with it. But also, it's, it's a proper driver's track. I think if you look at how they, they push the limits and everything, it's it's uh, the drifting around. So yeah, I think. Um, if you don't put it together as a driver and even with the best powertrain, I don't think it's, it's happening on this track. Well, the checkered flag is about to come out. This will be a lot of drivers' final flying laps in this session. As we look at the Costa, he's been threading the Ivan Needle through his personal best in the first and second sector. He's going to come around to take the checkered flag. And where is he going to go? Is he going to improve? He is indeed. Goes second fastest by 45 hundredths of a second away 
from Oliver Rowland. So now the rest of the drivers coming through. Verline goes up into second as well. So not a bad end to the session for the winner from round one in Mexico. The two Tagore Porsches, second and third fastest as it stands currently, but still quite a few who are yet to take the chequered flag. What about Buemi? He was lighting up the tarmac a few moments ago. Is he going to be able to improve on 12 fastest? No, not quite. Stays that position as Van Dorn just goes up into ninth place as well in the DS Penske. Roland still it is that he's fastest, but Cassidy's on an absolute flyer here in this second sector. 17th fastest he is at the moment, makes his way out of turn 20, aims it for the timing line. Gunter goes up into second place in the Maserati. Cassidy goes fifth, loses a bit of time there in the final sector. Unless Norman Natto can pull something out of the bag right at the closing age, age, stages of this, I'll put my teeth back in, as uh, Mitch Evans goes fastest of the lot with a 1.19.339, 61 hundredths of a second ahead of Oliver Rowland. So the lap time's coming in thick and fast at the end of FP2 here. Yeah, that's always, especially with a drying track in turn one. I think uh, lap times are coming down quick, and uh, the last one over the line is... Uh, He's always uh, having a better shot, but that shows how good Roland's lap was because he set that like um, a few minutes before everyone else. Yeah, especially with the track evolving over the course of this session, to be able to do that before the end of it is really impressive. Let's have a look here at Robin Freitz. Saw him uh, pushing the limits, and that is just a little bit too much from the rear into that first corner. That's what I was mentioning before. You see, like he was hitting the brakes really hard, but you didn't see any wheels locking. So, like it's almost like the cars have ABS now. Yeah, super impressive stuff. Let's have another look here. This is Nick Cassidy, whereas he lost the rear going into the chicane of 16 and 17, and had to sit there and wait for everybody to come on through. But thankfully, all okay after a three-point turn, which if he was sitting his driving exam, he probably would have passed because it was quite impressive actually. But uh, nonetheless, a good end to the session for both the Jaguars. Mitch Evans, fastest of the lot. He'll be pretty pleased with that. And then that is Cassidy there just uh, again going about after his uh, three-point turn. So now the drivers are lining up on the grid here, ready to do their practice starts. Team Radio for Evans. One. Uh, tenth and a half, Sector 2. Up to two tenths, uh, Sector 3, two ultimates. So yeah, is that saying that the be alive here. Sounds like he's out of breath after that lap. Yes, yeah, well, I told <laughs> you, I think it's very physical for the drivers. Um, the most physical track for me was always London um, because it was uh, so so twisty and you were like so busy on the steering wheel. For some some reason, the, the, the force on the steering wheel is, it was quite heavy. So, um, yeah, you really get out of breath. It's like a proper gym session. And I think it's, uh, it's a similar situation here. Well, drivers going about their practice starts, but of course it is still quite wet on the on the start finish straight here, Zane. So is this going to be of any sort of useful data for the teams at this point? Yeah, well, I mean, at some point in the year, you you kind of get a wet a wet start, dry start. So I think that all of these uh, starts right now will help through the whole season. Of course, uh, hopefully, everyone's hoping for for later today that uh, it's going to be dry in turn one. But we see it's quite dusty offline as well. It's, it's very difficult right now for everyone. Yeah, it's going to be hugely interesting to see how the track evolves as we head into qualifying, as we look at some highlights out of Turn 3 for the drivers. Some exploring the limits a little bit more than others. Let's have a look then, shall we, at the results from uh, Free Practice 2. Here in Tokyo, it is Mitch Evans for Jaguar TCS Racing in their 100th race, who ends up fastest here this morning, ahead of Oliver Rowland and Max Gunter. Three different powertrains there in the top three, ahead of the Tag Heuer Porsches in fourth and fifth place, Nick Cassidy sixth, Norman Natto, the first of the Andrettis in seventh, ahead of Edo Mortara, great result for him in the Mahindra in eighth place. John Eric Verne is ninth, Jake Dennis inside the top ten after a challenging start to his weekend yesterday. He'll be hoping for a similar result in the group stages. Hopefully to make it a little bit further up, actually, to make it into the duels. Sofa Van Dorn, 11th, ahead of Freitz, Muller, Buemi, Lucas de Grassi. Jake Hughes down there in 16th place, ahead of Sasha Fenestraz in the second of the Nissans. Nick De Vries, we saw his front wing on the track after coming uh, together with the barrier. 18th for him, ahead of Sergio Sete Camera, Jay Handerubala, Sam Bird and Dan Tictum completing the order for free practice two. Well, there we are, a hugely interesting uh, FP2 session, and now 
the debriefs all begin and it's all focused on qualifying. Yeah, exactly. And what's interesting in this session is uh, you see that the gaps uh, between the first and the, the last car are quite much bigger than in Sao Paulo. So um, that shows that there's still a little more to come for some drivers and putting things together and understand everything. So, um, but yeah, now with the, um, the qualifying format, I think you still have a bit of a shot to get into the rhythm. And yeah, the big question will be, like I said, um, is it out prep push or how many attempts can you go for and find a good rhythm to, to put that, that lap together and hopefully get into the duel. Yeah, you see the drivers here, this is going uh, through the chicane in the second sector of turns 10 and 11, just flirting with the inner curve there on the inside. So, as I said, an exciting free practice two session, but uh, I make that we've got, well, we've got Jaguar, Nissan, Maserati, and then Porsche powertrain. So four different powertrain manufacturers inside the top four. That's the one thing we love about Formula E, Zane, is the unpredictable nature of it, and, and that just goes to prove that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think like Andre said earlier, it's, it's a real driver's track. Um, and everyone will be trying to explore their limits. And, and that session was very important. Now going into straight into qualifying, that was the feeling that you're going to get for, for, for qualifying. So I mean, I, I'm sure all the drivers will be going through with their engineers, looking, looking at the data. Um, and for sure, the, the gaps will close up in qualifying. And I'm sure it'll be very close. Absolutely. Well, drivers now coming back into the pit lane at the end of free practice too. Thank you very much indeed for joining us for this one. Not long until we get ourselves underway uh, for qualifying here later on this morning. And as you can see, Max Gunter in the garage. Likewise, Pascal Verline as well. As they all make their way down to be weighed at the end of this session. So then some highlights from free practice two here this morning in Tokyo. It got underway in the sunshine, thankfully, following the sideways rain and wind that we had here yesterday. And we saw a few drivers pushing the limits, and especially out of turn three with that big compression. It is going to be exciting going into qualifying, but also critical, I'm sure, in the race as well to make sure that the drivers do not clip the wall on the outside, as we saw some doing. Uh, at that point in the lap. We also saw some others flirting with the wall on a few occasions, including Lucas de Grassi, who lost part of his front wing. Likewise, Edna Mortara took out one of our cameras. We'll send in the bill in the post. You see Frederick Bertrand there just watching on for Team Mahindra. What do you think we've learned from this session here, Andre? Well, um, I think everyone learned a lot because yeah, new track, it's, it's always challenging. I think the teams will be looking at all the sectors and the GPS traces from, from everyone else to see where there's time to gain, where can the driver break later. And um, yeah, still with turn one wet, it's, uh, it's still a question mark. And I think the bigger question will be how to use the tires the best and uh, how to improve the car as well. It's a new track. Well, qualifying kicks off at 20 past 10 local time here in Tokyo. Thank you very much indeed for joining us for free practice two. From Zay Maloney, from Andre Lotterer and from myself, Tom Brooks, we will uh, see you all again for quali as we get ready to decide the grid for the Tokyo e Prix. So then just looking here in the uh, Nissan garage, Oliver Rowland taking off his uh, special liveried helmet. And suit. And suit as well, yeah. They're loving the uh, cherry, cherry blossom, blossom season, aren't they? Yeah. Do you know, it's interesting though, I was speaking to somebody um, the other day about it, and they said that they've never done anything like it. Cherry blossom actually a couple of weeks late this year because of all the bad weather they've been having in Japan. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's a big thing here. I've been living here 15 years actually, and cherry blossom is it's, it's huge. And uh, actually they have in the, in the weather channel a percentage of the blooming. So the, they know exactly the, when it will bloom at 100% and when they, they want to enjoy it and uh, take the pictures yeah. of, the, of the cherry blossoms and sitting under the trees. Well, the drivers then making their way back in to the Way Bridge. We'll get ready for qualifying then coming up later on this morning here in Japan. See you then.